Hello, everyone. Welcome in. You are watching another episode of the Mindfulness Podcast Series. Today, we have a special guest with us here, Pastor James Rathman of Redemption Church, Denver. Thanks, James, for coming on to the show today. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about Christianity and then forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Why is it important to practice forgiveness? Mm, great. So the first question I wanted to ask you is, how did you know you wanted to become a minister? Great question. Um, I think back in high school, when I became a Christian, I became pretty interested in the idea of becoming a pastor, but then it, it didn't, it didn't really seem realistic or like something that was an opportunity for me in, in my life. I grew up in and around the car business and um, kind of expected to be a part of that when I was growing up. And then um, that opportunity kind of went away. And I, I suddenly was like, you know, that, that there's kind of a whole world that's opened up and I could be a part of all kinds of things. And the thing that really just continued to interest me both, most was, was my faith. And the things that were really the most impactful for me in my faith in terms of it growing was preaching, sitting under and hearing great preaching and listening to preaching and getting CDs of preachers and listening to sermons over and over again. And that was something that was really impactful and beneficial for me. And so I, I think I, I just wanted to be a part of that for other folks. And when I graduated college, I didn't go into ministry right out of school, but instead just into the working world, got a sales job that ended up selling cars for a bit again. But then this, in the back of my mind was always this, man, I'd really like to angle towards ministry and full-time ministry. Uh, and I got the opportunity to through the church that our church came out of, um, which was called L2 Church. And they were looking for a associate pastor, which I didn't really know. It was just the church that I was attending. But I had shared with the pastor there that I was interested in pursuing ministry, probably on like a 10-year sort of time frame. And he said, well, the best way to learn how to do this is to just jump in and do it. So they hired me and I started attending seminary and was working there as associate pastor and then became the lead pastor in 2018. Beautiful. So it's so, it sounds like Christianity was something that was always kind of a part of your life. But then as you got older, you felt the Holy Spirit kind of tugging on your heart saying, this, this is the path for you. That ministry is the path for you. Yeah, I think so. I think I had sort of denied that. Um, but then it's sort of just a, a matter of looking at what I liked and then realizing it's like the things that you like, you think everybody likes. And that's not true. So it was kind of realizing that like, I love Bible study. I love teaching. I like sort of the varied nature of a pastoral role, which is like part teacher, part managing an organization, part just relationships, a lot of relationships. And so I kind of liked that, that mix and then recognizing, Hey, this thing that this desire that the Lord has given me, or these, these things that I really enjoy being a part of, I could use to serve the church and not everybody wants to do that. So it's probably a good fit. And then when the opportunity presented itself, it was just that sort of final clarity of like this is this is the final sign that God's given me. Okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I love the fact that you mention when it comes to or alluding to that when it comes to us following the path that God has for us, that some of those clues are things that we already enjoy, like something that God has given you a passion for will be connected to the purpose that God has for your life. Do you think that's often true? You know, it's wonderful when it is, <laughs> but what I think happens most often is God uses your gifts to get you in over your head 
so that you have to depend upon him and your weakness. I think that's the typical pattern. And I think that's what God did with me. Like he used my giftings of teaching and he got me into a role that was way in over my head. And then I had to learn to depend upon him because the, the place where you're really effective and where you really work is a place of dependence. I love that. You said God uses our strengths to get us in over our heads so that we can depend on him and our weakness. Yes. Do you feel like that same transition process happens when people become Christians? And when you look at your relationship with God and, and becoming a Christian, was that was it similar to that path where like you had all these talents and you felt the Holy Spirit tugging on your heartstrings? What kind of patterns do you see in other people as well when they're transitioning to that relationship with God? I think it's a recognition of need. And so it happens in a lot of different ways. For some folks, they're raised in it and they're taught this and they're given sort of the framework for understanding their life. And so when they encounter their weaknesses, it's not so much of a shock or when they encounter their limits or evil in the world or when, when they encounter those things, they've been equipped from a young age with a worldview that says like, hey, people are made in the image of God, but they're radically fallen and radically sinful. So when they experience that radical sin, they're not thrown off. They're raised and equipped with this understanding of, I have this same sinful tendency in me. So when they experience that in themselves, they are given a place of how to use that and how to bring that to the Lord in trust that he is faithful and will provide and care and meet you in that place of weakness. Others, I think, I, I think I see a common pattern of folks kind of come of age or into the world with a lot of naivety in a general sense that people are generally good and that uh, bad things happening is generally an exception. And then when they encounter the dangers and the, the limits of their own personalities or of their own uh, family lives or those sorts of things, then it, it really presses them into this need that they have for something greater, a greater part of the story that can hold those things together. And so a lot of times the point of becoming a Christian is the point of recognition of your own need and your own weakness. And most particularly your own sinfulness. You know, the mark of maturity is, hey, you know, that toxic system I was a victim of, I was a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and when that goes off, it's like, oh man, if the problem isn't just sorting out the, the world around me, and if everybody else was just behaving right and things would go fine and you recognize, oh, the problem is me. And wherever I go, I, I tend to create these same sorts of patterns and find myself in these same sorts of situations. Then you realize, oh, I need to be saved. I need someone to come and rescue me, even from me. And then in that's when you start to see the grace of the Lord, which is that while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. And so now there's something to do with that. So if we can sort of map this out first way, I think people sort of grow up in the faith. They're equipped with this worldview, have an understanding of what to do when they encounter sinfulness and brokenness. So in their encounter of, sin, of their own sinfulness and brokenness, then they're drawn to the Lord in his compassion and grace for a sinner. And the third, which is, uh, one that's uh, that's also very common is in the discovery of the the dangers and the sin of the world, then I think a lot of folks just develop a cynicism, mm -hmm. which is that this is just the way the world is. And rather than um, ho getting my hopes up again, just to be let down by the way the world is, then you become hopeless and very shrewd and uh, you just try and play the game of the world as best as you can. And that, that's a way to to avoid uh, seeking the Lord. How do we get rid of that, that sense of hopelessness? Like if, if somebody's watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and thinking, that's me, like I, I want to believe in God. I, I want to have a relationship with God, but I'm, I'm scared because I feel like I've been let down in the past and why is this happening to me kind of struggle with within their belief? Because the belief is there, the belief that God 
exists is there, but then somehow there's this this disconnect and willingness to be vulnerable and walk with God. I think that the the ticket is this is what sets Christianity apart is you know it's one thing to recognize there is God and He exists up there, and I'm down here and I want to relate to Him in some way, but relating to God. I mean, he is before all things. He created all things. He is over all things. He is he is utterly transcendent. There are no words that can capture him. How do you relate to that? <laughs> and yet we know that we we must, if our lives are to be to have any sort of hope. Christianity describes that that very God took on flesh and became a man. And that man is Jesus Christ. In order that we might know this God and know him in the deepest way that we know anything, which is a a relational knowing. You know, we don't know God like we know the law of gravity. We know God like we know our wife or husband or our um, best friend, or we know him relationally. And that's possible because of the incarnation. And so when we realize that when we're getting to know the truth, we're getting to know a person, then that changes the approach that we would take to get to know him. So we're not just seeking clever sayings or principles by which to lead our life, or the next best morning routine, or the next thing that's missing from your diet, or that you need to stop eating, or there's not just like a tool or a tactic, or a trick, um, or a practice even. Uh, It's a person that we're getting to know. And that is a, so that's the first thing is that Christianity offers us, we can know that person by the incarnation. You know, a person, you learn their story. You know, that's how, that's how you get to know a person. And Christ has shown us his story. That's what the scriptures are, or the story of Christ. And then we relate to him by prayer and by seeking him out in obedience. And so that we start to, something can happen and your husband wouldn't even be around. And you would know, I know what he would think in this situation. I know what he would do in this situation, just because you know him. Yeah. And it, we're able to relate to Christ in that same way. Now, that's wonderful. And the incarnation is wonderful, but it's not enough. Because the incarnate Christ is, is perfect. And he is very God. You know, he is the true God. And so in that sense, he's still wildly beyond us. And, and we know that our ability to, to truly know him in a sense, depends upon our faithfulness. You know, you can think of it like a marriage, like your ability to truly know your spouse depends upon your faithfulness to them. Because if you're not faithful to them, then you not only do they not get to know you because of the deception, but you also don't get to know them because the deception creates like a barrier. Mm-hmm. So we live in this pattern of deception. That's one way to think of sin. So what Christ does is he doesn't just become a man, but then he takes the punishment due to our sin upon himself so that we can be made clean in his sight and pure in his sight, not because of anything that we did, but all because of what he has done. And so in his accomplishing of that, now we have free access to him where we can be totally honest, no hiding, even with regards to the thing which creates a barrier, which is our sin, because we know that he has dealt with it and he's taken care of it. And then after his resurrection, he gives us his Holy Spirit. So that just, he kind of like works both sides of the relationship. It's like he comes to us, but a relationship requires us to come to him too. 
but we can't because of our sin. But he works that side of the relationship too, so that we are able to be united to him. So Christianity has this unique story where we relate to the truth because the truth is not abstract, but a person. And so we get to know him the way that we get to know a person and we get to know a person by faithfulness. Then he equips us by his spirit to be faithful to him. Now for hopelessness, because you had mentioned that, how, how do you speak to somebody who's feeling hopeless? Yes. So we have to consider what hope is. Hope is one of those virtues that is wonderful to say, but is difficult to experience. The Apostle Paul says, we hope for what we do not see, because who hopes for what he already sees? You don't hope for something that you have. That's by definition, that's not hope. So hope is this two component idea. First component is you don't have it. If you have it, that's not hope, that's thankfulness. But hope means you don't have it. So that's difficult and painful. It's difficult to not have something that you desire or something that is good. But it means that you know because of the faith, the Christian hope means that you know because of the faithfulness of God, you will one day have it. And that all of the things in this life which point towards you not experiencing the goodness of God will all become untrue. Because from a framework of existence that doesn't acknowledge the reality of God, hopelessness is reasonable. Mm. Because everyone you know will die. And you will die. And when you die, probably... Do you know your great-grandparents' names? No. Me neither. Three generations. Completely forgotten. In our own families. That's meaningless. You know, if you were to just assess the data, then it would be reasonable to conclude, well, if it all ends in death, then it is all fundamentally meaningless. And that's a true conclusion. It's a true conclusion. And so many of the greatest minds in the world have have been honest enough to conclude that. If it all ends in death, then it is meaningless. And if you don't acknowledge that, then you're just living in some realm of self-deception. But that's why the Christian story is the story that has at its center hope. Because we understand that death leads to resurrection that our hope in Christ is that because he died and was resurrected and promised that by faith in him, when we die, we too will be resurrected. That we have this ultimate hope that death and sin, which always seem to have the final answer in the world, will not have the final answer. And so we can have this deep hope that can surpass even the most harsh and terrible data of our lives. You know, the, the death of a loved one or the, all these things which come to an end, the loose ends of a relationship that don't seem to be able to ever resolve the hopelessness of restoring relationship with your parents or with your spouse or with your children. These, these things that we just find in this life, they're ultimately hopeless. We know that they're not. They're not because Christ died and for three days was dead. And that looked like the end, but it wasn't the end. It was actually him accomplishing the greatest rescue. And so we, we have reason to hope. I love that. So like having that relationship with God changes a person's perspective so that they can then have hope exactly because the whole story is reframed i think hope is like a something that we think everybody has always liked 
<laughs> but we only think that because we're in a culture that's so informed by Christianity. The ancient Greeks thought hope was foolish. Thucydides describes hope as uh, if somebody is to conjure is trying to conjure hope in you, then they're just trying to sell you something. Mm -hmm. um, and so hope was a was a way of ignoring reality. And that makes sense when you don't believe in resurrection. Because if you don't believe in resurrection, then the whole story, whatever you're doing, just ends in death. And if you zoom out long enough, the sun expands, swallows the earth, and there's nobody left to remember anything that's ever happened. That's meaningless. Uh, but if at the center of world history, perhaps such that we would set our calendars to where they count backwards down to it and then count up from it, is the event of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which reframes the data because it shows us that we are not hopeless, even to the uttermost, to the most consequential thing, which is death itself. So if we are not hopeless in the face of death itself, that means that we can have hope in any circumstance. I love that like God can, having that relationship with God and shifting our perspective gives us hope that we can, we know that we can have salvation through Christ Jesus, that we can have a re relationship with God and have a life after that. That's a meaningful life, right? Yes, yes. I like how you mentioned earlier um, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins and to save us from ourselves because so often it seems like we're we're self-sabotaging you know and um like being a slave to our own sin and to our own flesh and i wanted to bring that back to the topic of forgiveness like when when we say okay i i'm tired of being a slave to my sin like god god forgive me how would you recommend someone go about initiating that relationship with God? Because I think so many times people feel like I want to change, but I don't deserve God's forgiveness. Or how would that conversation even start? Because they don't feel like they have a relationship with God yet. Yes. That's it. Can we pause? And um, I need to grab something real quick. and I'll be right back. Yes. To answer definitely. that question. Okay. So what we recognize, first of all, is that God is the one who does the initiating. Mm -hmm. And so ways that we experience that, that initiation are recognition of our sin against him recognition of the offer of grace that's given to us in the gospel. And then in that initiation that he's done by his spirit, we're beginning to see the world clearly and truthfully. Oh, the world is not meaningless chaos headed towards nothing, but the meaning that I seem to experience or get glimmers of in the world is actually true. Oh man, if that's actually true, then I've lived against that for so much of my life and in so many different ways, I disregard the truth of the world that I live in. That means that I, I need forgiveness for the way that I have sinned against the creator of the world, the way that I have misused the very life that he has freely given to me. And at that initiation with the, that sort of recognition, then the offer is simply a taking it up and beginning to trust what it is he says he's accomplished on your behalf. And what he says he's accomplished on your behalf is that he became sin, the one who never knew sin, became sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so what we what we begin to trust is that what we deserve for our sin, which is the punishment of death, has already been paid by him. So it's all the guilt that we have acquired has been taken on by him perfectly. And then it's it's not just that, it's actually even better than that. It's not that we're just brought back to square one, but that the very righteousness that he demonstrated in the world is freely given by God to us so that we are treated by God as though we are as righteous as his son, Jesus Christ. And then with gratitude, we begin to have our hearts transformed by his spirit. And so it's a simple trusting in Jesus is as simple as just extending, extending trust like you would do to anyone. And that means it involves all the risk of making yourself vulnerable to extend trust to someone. But it is, in another sense, the least risky thing possible because the one that you are extending trust to is God himself who cannot lie and has has already done the hardest thing in order that you might be saved just because of his love and just because of his grace towards you, which was giving his son so that we might be saved. So when we see that story, then we're able to just come to him and pray, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Let me trust in Jesus Christ. The recognition that the Lord does not just save us into a void, but he saves us in, into a family. And that family is his church. And so he brings us into the body and the community of his people, which is his church, which he describes as his body. So that means like it's it, the place where he is acting in the world. And so that becomes the place where that community of people is a place where we experience the love of God. We're able to give the love of God to one another. When we sin against one another, we're able to forgive each other and we're able to worship him and receive his teaching it's as simple as just trusting him and it's as big as like an adoption into a new family i like that i like how you describe that process of being saved through faith and by the grace of god and including us being saved into god's family and that being the church the way you describe it is almost like the church like the body of christ being a shield almost like a way to help Mm. um, us that's great keep that strong relationship with god yeah it is it is i think that's a great way to i think that's a great way to understand it is like a like a shield one of the things that's wonderful about christianity is a lot of people are seeking peace. One way that you can seek peace is to say, well, the world's not really as bad as it seems. Everybody's just focusing on the bad things. And and it's sort of to like ignore the pain and difficulties of the world. That's one way to seek peace. But ultimately it's just self-deception. And often it's ignoring injustice that's in the world. So it's very thin and it doesn't last. But if it does last, then people just become naive. But the way that we seek peace is not a peace that's in this world, but it's a peace in the one who governs the world, who teaches us that in this life, there will be difficulty. Okay, well, that opens our eyes and allows us to be wise and understanding of the world as it really is. No self-deception. We can name things as they really are. We can call evil, evil. We can call good, good. We don't have to play any games or any tricks on ourselves. Now we would think, okay, well, that means that I'll never have peace because look at all the wickedness and danger and strife in the world and in my own soul and my own heart. Well, 
we trust that the one who is governing the world is governing is governing it towards his good ends and his good purposes so that all things will work together for good to those who love Jesus Christ to those who are called according to his purpose and so while we can't trace the story of how this will become a good thing or how this will be beautiful in its time or how this will resolve or not you know we only live for 70 years or 80 or 90 whatever we get this little slice of existence we trust that those will lay themselves out in a way which will prove the glory and the goodness of God. And so we can face the difficulties of life with peace, knowing that he is in absolute control. And we can know that even in the most dire circumstances, even circumstances involving death, because he himself came and by his death, which was the worst thing that ever happened. The sinless one, the perfect one, God himself murdered. That's the worst sin ever committed. And by it, God accomplished the greatest thing possible, which is the salvation of the world. So that should break our imaginations. So that all of a sudden there's nothing in which by faith, we wouldn't be able to say the Lord, even in this, can accomplish his glory and can demonstrate his goodness. That's a different type of peace. It's not a, it's not a detached piece of retreat, but it's a present peace that is wise and open and able to see and enter into the difficulties of the world, but have a trust that goes beyond them that the Lord can work through these things. Trusting and having that faith in the relationship with God allows us to have peace in any circumstance because we know that he's with us, that he's in control, even in the world. Yep. That's right. That's right. So when we're looking at how much God has loved us and has forgiven us for our sins in spite of ourselves, when we, when we come to him, when we have people that are looking at like, Oh, well, you know, I think God is good and and I want to have a relationship with him, but I don't want to forgive the people that have wronged me, right? And I don't need to go to church. I can maintain this relationship with God on my own, without the Bible, without worship, without this community, without this sh- safe place, this shield that God has provided for us. How do you... What would you say to that person? Well, the claims of Jesus are really an all or nothing proposition. Because if he's really God and he really died and really came back from the dead, then that means whatever he says, whatever he requires of you, then that's the truth. And that's what he requires of you. If Jesus didn't die and come back from the dead, then who cares? (laughs) Who cares what he said? And I'll just pick some things that I seem to like and I'll reject the rest that I seem to not like. But if he really died and really came back from the dead, then, then that means what he said about how that accomplished our salvation is trustworthy and true and worth holding on to. But that also means that all else he said about being drawn into his presence through the church, about him giving his Holy Spirit to the church, about our need for the love of one another to abide in him, then those things are true too. And so it encapsulates our whole life. Now, the other question in there was about forgiveness and the difficulty of forgiveness. Forgiveness is is at the center of Christianity because it is something that we receive from the Lord freely, you know, you can hear it in the word forgive, like before you do anything, he gives to you. Mm. And so that is the pattern of Christian love. It's like the way that you love an infant or a newborn. They haven't done anything for you, but if you give them love, then they will by that love become a whole person. Well, that's true of us with the Lord. We give him nothing. 
But when he gives us his love, we become whole people redeemed in him. It's forgiveness. Now, that also works in terms of a debt. You know, not only when we have given him nothing does he give to us, but even when we have taken, he gives to us. And so that is the type of love and forgiveness that we've received from the Lord. Now, the way that we participate in the love and forgiveness of God is by giving that love and forgiveness to one another. So what the Lord has accomplished in us, we are able to give into the world. And that by forgiving, that's actually one of the means that God has given us to receive and understand and fully experience his forgiveness. So the stakes are high. It might help to look at the way Jesus describes this in one of his parables. So this is in Matthew 18, and it's called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Jesus is trying to prod our imaginations to get an understanding of what it means to be forgiven by the Lord. So it starts with a question from Peter, one of Jesus's disciples, guys who followed him around and learned from him. It says, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? This is a type of question that we ask all the time. Like yeah. it, right now, there's sort of like different trends in culture where ways that people try and understand themselves or different like therapeutic or psychological trends. One of those, they're, they're not bad necessarily or, or good necessarily. They just, this just happens, you know. Um, but one of those right now is um, boundaries. So everybody's talking about boundaries. You've got to set boundaries for yourself. You've got to remove those toxic people from your life. That's a, that's a frame that we really think in. And so you can see how Peter's thinking in that frame too. Saying, if someone sins against me s- seven times, do I still need to forgive them? Like, when do I finally say enough? I don't forgive you anymore. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And 77, like multiplying it in that way, is sort of like a very Jewish way of saying, you just keep forgiving. You just keep forgiving. And that sounds absurd to our ears, but it sounded absurd then too. So he tells them a story. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So there's a king and he has servants. And there's different accounts. You know, they've come to the king and said, hey, can I get an advance on my paycheck and I'll make it up for you later? Or can I get this money because my mother-in-law got sick and I need to buy a hospital bed or whatever? Probably not exactly those things, but whatever the equivalent 2,000 years ago was of those things. So the king gave them these, these things. Now they have these debts that they owe the king. So he's looking to settle those. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, which is a lot. Just think a lot, like more than could be paid back. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So slavery and basically all cultures acted as a sort of backstop against debt. We have bankruptcy. Um, but that's a modern innovation. Uh, in basically all cultures, uh, slavery was was the way that debts were finally accounted for. So if you finally couldn't pay, then you would sell yourself. And so the king says, okay, you can't pay. We'll sell you. And that will cover the debts. So the servant hears this and he falls on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And then out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. So he pleads, he has pity. And the king says, okay, I'll just forgive the debt. That's the the foundation of the story, but it goes on. It says, but when the same servant went out, 
So that same servant who has just forgiven this huge debt. When he went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So he owed 10,000. He finds another one of his servants who owes him a hundred, which is like a lunch. Yeah. It's a lot less than 10,000. Way less than 10,000. And he seizes him and he begins to choke him saying, pay what you owe me. So the one who has just forgiven this huge debt finds the servant who owes him, seizes him, begins to choke him saying, pay what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Same thing he had just said to the king. Mm. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, so some other folks saw this interaction take place and they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all his debts. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Mm -hmm. So you see that the way that we participate in the forgiveness of the Lord is by recognizing we have been forgiven. I have been forgiven of this incredible debt, an unthinkable debt of what I owe to the Lord. Incalculable. And yet, this wrong that's been done against me, I will not forgive. It shows that you have not really received the forgiveness of the Lord. Mm. And so our ability to forgive stems from a deep recognition of the forgiveness that's been given to us. So when you find that you can't forgive, it is likely that you do not understand the forgiveness that has been given to you. But when you understand the depth of the forgiveness that's been granted to you, then you receive the ability to forgive. I love that. I, that's true. So many times we, I feel like we've all been there where something has happened to us in this like self-righteous um, nature of our flesh feels like we're entitled to some sort of special treatment um, that absolves us from being sinned against after the way that we sin against God. But then yep. I love how you gave the example of forgiveness being like a bridge, right? Into having a whole relationship with God. So if we block someone else from receiving our forgiveness, we're also blocking ourselves from being blessed by God because it's part of his instruction or requirement of us. Like we were talking about requirements before, it's like repentance, forgiveness, the assembly of yourselves together in church. Exactly. These are all part of the cocktail of uh, Christianity and of what he's given to us. So that like what he's done for us has these implications for us that are really transformative and life-giving all because of what he's done for us. What a beautiful gift. Yes. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor James, for coming on and sharing with us today. Um, we're so grateful. Thank you for letting God speak through and live in you and your family. Um, I pray that you continue to bless so many more people. And thank you guys so much for watching. And we will look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Great. Bye, Thanks, Veronica. Thanks. James. Thank you. I will make sure to link like if someone's speaking. Oh, man, I love this message today. I know you also have a podcast with the church, correct? Yeah, that's right. They can just search Redemption Church Denver, and they'll be able to find a podcast that's our sermons uh, from the church. And if they're local, come check us out 930 on Sunday mornings. 
Awesome. Thank you. I will link Pastor James' information below, and I will see you on Sunday. Bye. Bye. Great. See you then. Thanks, Veronica. Thanks.